Hello, I am Michele Paolato, a research associate at Imperial College of London in the Department of Earth Science and Engineering. What follows is a presentation I gave at the American Geophysical Union Fall Meeting in San Francisco on the 16th of December 2016. I hope you enjoy it. The title is Subduction and Dehydration of Slow Spread Oceanic Lithosphere and was presented at the session Subduction Top to Bottom. The work was carried out at GeoAzur, part of the University of the Côte d'Azur, and was supported by an AXA Research Fund postdoctoral fellowship and by the OBSIVA project, funded by a prize of the Foundation Simone Encino del Duca through the French Academy of Science. After a brief introduction, I will present a new tomography model of the Lesser Antilles subduction zone, where the subducting slab was formed by slow spreading at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. I will then discuss what the tomography can tell us about water transport and release from this atypical slab. Water can be stored in rocks as pore fluids in microscopic cavities within the solid matrix or as bound water in hydrous minerals like serpentine or incorporated in the structure of nominally anhydrous minerals like olivine. As the plate subducts, temperature and pressure increase and most of the stored water is released from the slab, initially through fluid escape and compaction and later through chemical dehydration. Most of the free fluids escape through the accretionary prism at shallow level. Then, at intermediate levels, it is chemical dehydration that dominates. Beneath the arc, fluids released from the slab are responsible for lowering the melting point of the mantle wedge and giving rise to arc magmatism. Since water, both in the form of pore fluid and as bound water in the structure of minerals, affects the seismic properties of rocks, we can use seismic techniques to track water fluxes in the subsurface, and particularly in subducting slabs. Subduction zones can be classified as hot or cold. On the one hand, we have places like Nankai, where a hot young lithosphere is being subducted, and the hot thermal structure causes early dehydration of the slab, shallow seismicity in the reduced seismogenic zone. On the other hand, we have places like Tohoku, where an old and cold lithosphere is being subducted, resulting in deeper slab dehydration, greater water transport to sub-arc depths, and the characteristic double seismic zone. Other subduction zones tend to fall between these two end members, depending on plate age, convergence rate, and slab dip. But there is a fourth factor that is rarely taken into account, and that's the spreading rate at the time of accretion of the incoming plate. Plate dehydration models have been developed for Pacific subduction zones and generally assume a normal crustal composition and thickness, as would be expected for fast spread crust. We know, however, that on slow spread crust, thickness and composition can vary laterally, in particular, in places of low magmatic input, the volcanic layer can be greatly reduced or even absent, and the crust can be composed largely of hydrated peridotites and gabbros brought to the surface by the action of low angle detachment faults. This can result in greatly increased water content, on average, on the subducting slab. Many examples of this behavior have been observed on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. We see here a 300 km section that was studied by David Smith and others who showed that crustal thickness varies quite significantly and on large areas of the seafloor, serpentinized mantle peridotites are exposed through the action of detachment faults. When these regions are subducted, they may affect water input into the mantle. This is the Central Atlantic Ocean, and this is that section of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that I just showed in the previous slide. My study area is the central part of the Lesser Antilles subduction zone, where slab accreted at that section of the ridge is currently being subducted. Zooming in on the study area, we see that it extends from Martinique in the south to Montserrat in the north. Notice the subducting Atlantic plate 
dipping beneath the Caribbean plate. My study is based on a series of active source seismic experiments carried out in the late 90s and the years 2000s. They provide a total of almost half a million P wave travel times. These were recorded on an amphibious array of ocean bottom seismometers and land stations. This is the ray coverage from the active source data, showing that it samples quite well the crust of the overriding plate, but it cannot sample the mantle wedge in the slab. For this reason, I've added data from local earthquakes, and these can sample the slab much better. I've used P waves and S waves from the shots and the local earthquakes to obtain a model of P wave velocities and VPVS ratio in the region. I've used a widely used seismic tomography code called Simul PS, developed by Thurber and Eberhard Phillips. My work relies on the joint effort of a large number of people, so I would like to thank the most important ones, including Gaye Bayrakchi, Martin Sapan, Alfred Hirn, Adrian Kopp, Gail Christensen, and of course my co-authors, and others as well. This is the VP cube, however not all of it is well sampled. So now I've removed the areas that are not sampled by the data, and any interpretation will have to be restricted to this region. We can take some slices through the seismic velocity model to look at the main features. First notice the appearance of a dipping low VP layer corresponding to the slab crust. I would like to point out that I have not imposed any a priori slab in the starting model so the geometry is coming entirely from the data. Now looking at the VPVS ratio, we notice high VPVS ratio in blue in the forearc crust, at the top of the slab and in parts of the mantle wedge. A low VPVS ratio is observed in the arc crust, as would be expected for a more silicic continental-like material. We can use the VP model together with other constraints from multi-channel seismic profiles, from receiver functions and from the location of flat thrust earthquakes to pick the top of the subducting slab. We can then use this surface to extract the seismic velocities from the model. We can then look at the lateral and depth variations of VP along this surface. The first observation we can make is that along the slab top surface, VP increases initially quite rapidly down to the Mohawk contact, probably because of compaction and expulsion of pore fluids. Then VP increases more slowly, reaching 8 to 8.5 km per second at 70 to 100 km depth. So this depth is where the crustal low VP layer fades and transitions into high velocities. This we interpret as the depth range where crustal eclogitization happen. The second interesting observation regards the distribution of intraslab earthquakes. I am showing here the distribution of earthquakes with depth, and I have separated crustal earthquakes beneath the arc from supraslab earthquakes and intraslab earthquakes. We notice that the intraslab earthquakes are particularly clustered at two depth ranges, at 50 to 80 km depth and at 130 to 160 km depth. A third interesting observation is that just above the shallower of these two clusters, at 50 km depth, we find a local VP minimum on the slab top that is elongated and laterally continuous. These three observations together, we think suggest that we are seeing multiple stages of slab dehydration. First, the crust dehydrating at 50 to 100 km depth, and then the lithospheric mantle dehydrating at 130 to 160 km depth. We can compare these depths with the predictions made by Van Kecken and others based on the thermal models of subduction of Syracuse et al. and on phase diagrams for more. Look at the blue lines, which represent water loss as a function of depth, and you can see that there is a good agreement between the steps which represent fast water release from the slab and the depth of the clusters of seismicity. The shallower of these two clusters 
which corresponds to the first water loss event, also corresponds to the depth range where crustal eclogitization is thought to happen based on the observed increase in seismic velocity. So from looking at VP along the slab, it would seem that this slow spread crust actually behaves not very differently from what these models predict for normal oceanic crust, with the exception that there is some significant lateral variability. The lateral variability is particularly visible in the VPVS ratio. You can see that the shallow part of the slab has a high VPVS ratio, here shown in blue. And the deeper part has a lower VPVS ratio, here shown in red. The transition between these two zones is quite rapid and is observed at 50 km depth in the north and at 100 km depth in the south of the study area. In the south, the transition is also more gradual. We could infer that is, there is a deeper or greater water transport in the south. A possible vector for that extra water might be a thicker layer of subducted sediments. We know, in fact, that the incoming sediments at the trench are much thicker in the south because they are derived from the South American continent and the Orinoco Delta in particular. An independent indication of greater transport of sediments in the south comes from the observation in the geochemistries of lavas erupted in Martinique of the signature of sediment melting. An alternative hypothesis is that in the south we might have an anomalous tectonized crust and in fact here we find the prolongation of the marathon fracture zone. It is more likely that here we would find non-volcanic crust with a greater proportion of serpentinized peridotites which can transport more water to greater depth than hydrated gabbers and basalts. David Schlachpost and others came to a similar conclusion based on a study of the B-value for local earthquakes. They concluded that there is in this region a greater proportion of small earthquakes than we would normally expect, and they attributed this to weakening induced by serpentinization or high pore pressures. Finally, a last observation that we can make is that there is abundant mantle wedge seismicity, as has been observed in other subduction zones, including Cascadia, Ikurangi, and Greece. This seismicity is found above the region where we infer crustal dehydration to occur, and it is more abundant and deeper in the south, above the prolongation of the fracture zone. We can certainly speculate that it is fluid-related, but it is not associated with a large increase in the PVS ratio. Other scientists found evidence for mantle wedge seismicity in the Hikurangi margin and associated this seismicity with the 700 degrees isotherm, concluding that the seismicity must be related to a phase transition. In the case of the Lesser Antilles, however, the seismicity is diffuse therefore the mechanism to explain it might be different. So putting all our observations together, we conclude that this slow spread slab is at least in some regions behaving like we would expect for normal oceanic lithosphere. We observe multiple clusters of seismicity at 50 to 80 km depth and at 130 to 160 km depth. This suggests that there are multiple stages of dehydration with sediment compaction at shallow level, then chemical dehydration of the crust before 100 km depth, and finally the serpentinization of the slab beneath the arc. The local VP minimum on the slab top at 50 km depth and its correlation with intraslab and mantle wedge seismicity suggest either rapid water loss at this level or accumulation of fluids on the plate interface, causing high pore pressures or serpentinization in the mantle wedge. There are some significant lateral variations in seismic velocities and seismicity, and we attribute these to greater water transport near fracture zones, to lateral variations in compositions of the crust related to heterogeneous accretion on slow spreading ridges, and to variations in volume of subducted sediments. The final slide is just to point out that there are a number of other subduction zones worldwide where slow spread lithosphere is being subducted. We have demonstrated that they are likely to be characterized 
by significant lateral variability in water transport into the mantle. It is therefore important to quantify their effect in the global cycle of water in the solid earth. Thanks for listening and goodbye. If you enjoyed this video, consider liking it or leaving a comment down below. If you want more science, click here to see a cool 3D animation of the Lesser Antilles Lab.